Hey gamers, this is Liz Davidson from Beyond Solitaire, and I'm just going to give a quick overview of how to solo Dune Imperium with the Rise of Ix expansion, because I really, really like it. And what we're going to do is do a quick tour of the board, play through a couple of sample turns, and hopefully that'll give you a good idea of how to play. Before we fully get going, I do want to mention again, this is with the Rise of Ix expansion. So that's this board, which is a technology board. We'll talk about it. And then underneath here is the original board. So this is like an overlay. So originally the green and yellow uh, pentagon and triangle shapes did something slightly different in the game and Rise of X gives you what I consider to be better options. When you're playing Dune Imperium solo, essentially you play as normal and then you play against two automated opponents using what is called the House Hagal deck. And I'll be showing you exactly how to use that momentarily. And what you're all competing to do is be the first to reach 10 victory points. So everyone is in a very, very tight race to the top to be the first to cross that victory point threshold. So this symbol means victory point anywhere on the board. That means that you can get victory points for increasing your alliance power with various factions in the game. There are going to be some intrigue cards that might offer some end of game scoring. There are going to be conflict cards that can reward you with victory points if you win in a battle. And there are some tech options that also could offer victory points throughout the game. Additionally, if I can generate enough income, these Spice Must Flow cards don't do a whole lot for your hand of cards, but they do let you buy some victory points. So that might be something that you chose to do at the end of a game as well. As you can also see, we've also got some play areas set up with some starting resources. So here are the AI opponents that I've chosen to use. You can use various characters from the game who have special abilities, we're only going to be paying attention to the signet ring powers here on the right and not to the special ability on the left on the AI cards. But we're going to be playing against Earl Mimnon Thorvald, who starts with two agents and a water, Viscount Hundra Moritani, who also starts with two agents and a water, and I'll be playing as Duke Leto Atreides, and I will have a starting water, spice, and money, and two agents. I'm also going to get to start with three uh, troops in my garrison. At this level, the AI doesn't start with any. However, there are different starting resources for different difficulty levels, so be paying attention to that if you want to play a tougher game. One other thing you might notice is that I have a third worker up here, my Swordmaster, who I might be able to get later in the game. But the AI has their Swordmasters partway down at this conflict card deck, so they'll automatically come out after one, two, three, four, five rounds of the game. They'll automatically get that third agent. On higher difficulty levels, they pop up sooner. And there's also a difficulty level where you don't get a Swordmaster at all. So you can really customize this game to make it as difficult or as easy as you wish. The AI isn't going to have any cards. And I'm going to show you how they collect resources. But I have a little starting hand of cards. And I'm going to use this turn to kind of teach you how to play the game. So as we flip over our cards, you can see that there are a couple of different sections on each card. And each of these is going to do something different for you, depending on when and how they're played. Essentially what's going on here is I can use each card for one of two purposes. I can play it for its agent functions, which are these ones that are kind of with a beige -ish background, or on my reveal turn, which is what I do after I've deployed my agents, um, I can use them for the values at the bottom. So depending on what kind of strategy I want to play with, uh, that's what's going to matter to me. So for example, this signet ring is nice because I can play it on one of the matching spaces by shape and color. So I can play it on one of these green pentagon spaces, on one of the yellow triangle spaces, or on one of the blue circle spaces. And it's going to activate my signet ring power because it has a signet ring on it. For me, my signet ring power is prudent diplomacy. I can gain one influence with a faction where an opponent has more influence than me. So it's not necessarily going to benefit me on this turn since I've decided I'm going to go first. But on a fusion turn, my signet ring can let me play catch up with others and get little free shots of these pathways, which we're going to talk about. So these parts of the card tell you what you can do with your agent if you use the card on an agent turn. At the bottom of these cards, you're going to see various resource types or maybe nothing, depending on the kind of card it is. But these are influence. And at the reveal part of my turn, I could use them to purchase a card. Um, this card over here, as you can see, has daggers at the bottom of it. Those, when revealed, can be used in conflict. And then there are other fun little rewards potentially as well, depending on the cards that you get in the game. 
So when I talk about agent versus reveal turn, the other thing that's kind of interesting about this game is it's like a mix up between worker placement and deck builder. So my agents are essentially my workers. I'm going to be placing them in various locations on this board, depending on the cards that I play and just what I need to have happen. Then at the end of the turn, the deck building part happens because if I'm able to purchase a card, I can off the market that will then go to my deck and affect where I can place agents and what kinds of actions I can do with them. So with that said, I guess I will just play a couple of agent cards and we're just going to see where I decide to go and what I decide to do. So I think what I want to do is, so convincing argument doesn't do anything for an agent. It just has some influence at the bottom. So we're going to put this one down for the moment. We're not going to do anything with that. And then here's my symbol option palette here. I can play a lot of these little triangles. I can play circles and I can play the green pentagons. So what that basically means is that these different spaces are each going to give me something different if that's where I choose to put my agent. So if I put an agent here in Carthag, then I'll get a troop and an influence card. If I go to Arakeen, I'll get a troop and just a card draw off my deck. You can go here and draw more cards. And if I could go to Stitch Tabor, which I cannot, I could get a troop and a water. Up here on the top left is the cost. So sometimes it's just a symbol. So Carthag or Arakeen I can go to just because. The research station costs me that symbol on a card and two water resources. So I can't just go there right now because my starting water was just one. I only have one water. And then here for Sis Chamber, I need to influence with the Fremen in order to go here. So here are the Fremen. So one of the main ways to score points is to build alliances with our different groups. So let me put a cube for each of us over here where we're gonna show our growing connection with various factions in the game. Basically, these are additional action spots where if I have symbols on the card that I'm playing that correspond to the Fremen, the Bene Gesserit, the Spacing Guild, or the Emperor, then I can place agents in their action spaces over here. The Fremen can give me water and troops. The Bene Gesserit can give me intrigue cards and some card deck thinning. Basically, I can trash a card from the game and draw some off my deck. The Spacing Guild gives me a fold space card, which are these. They can go anywhere on the board, but then you have to get rid of them after you play them. So they're nice and then they're gone. Or some troops and water, although that's going to cost me quite a bit. And then the Emperor can give you wealth, more wealth, troops, and entry cards. So I might take actions to gain benefits from these spots. And then the sub benefit is that my relationship with these groups will go up. Uh, whoever has the highest and best relationship um, is the one who will claim this second victory point. So you can get a victory point just for being up two on each of these tracks. And then if you claim the alliance, then you get the benefit here. And then as long as you stay the highest, you get the token. So somebody could get ahead of you and take that token from you until somebody reaches the top. So be paying attention to those alliances as you go. The triangles typically will give you some spice or they can come to the chome board for interstellar shipping. So basically I can get money off of one of them. And then these little icons indicate that these tokens are moving up and down this board. And then basically you can move up per symbol and then you can get another symbol and drop all the way back down if you want to and get rewards. Or you can just go up one, up two, and then all the way back down. Basically this is just a way to pay in with these symbols in order to save up for these rewards. And then over here is the technology track. So the dreadnought space is extremely important because your dreadnought is a very nice thing to have in conflict when you're doing the combat part of the round. And then you can also buy these technologies that give you special abilities. Maybe they're one time or maybe they're persistent or maybe they let you do a special action once per round. It just kind of depends. And their prices are all listed in spice. So whereas spice used to be more of a money generator before Rise of Ix, uh, now the spice is used to power your tech. And then the other thing I need to do before we fully start playing a turn is flip this conflict card because we do have to know what we're fighting for. All right, so this conflict card is not the most exciting of conflict cards. Basically, it's one of those symbols that pushes you up the track over here on the little smuggling rewards board. Um, but second and third place get money. So it might be worth like having something in this contest, but yeah, this is, you know, there are, there are combats over victory points later in the game. I don't want to blow all of my military advantage right now. That said, what I might do is play Reconnaissance to go to a blue space, take an agent and put it here on Carthag. And then what I get to do is I get to recruit a troop. Um, and this is also a combat space. So you can see these little cross swords in the bottom right. What this means is that I can deploy to combat both the troop that I recruited this turn and up to two from my garrison. 
So I don't actually want to go all in, but I do want to take the troops that are recruited here and put it in the middle. And that means that I'm officially going to be engaged in this particular conflict. I'm also going to get one intrigue card because you should see them because they're cool. So this one is, if I have a seat on the High Council, I can get two troops. I don't have a seat on the High Council yet. That's up here. It's going to cost me a little money, but I can hold on to this and then wait and then spend it to get two troops, possibly at an inopportune moment. If I was playing with humans, I would wait and do this at the most annoying possible time. So for now, that's my entire turn. I went to a space, I did the things in the space, and I, you know, I had played the corresponding card to make that happen. So now it's time to do House of Gaul. So we are gonna have Earl Mimnon Thorvald go first because we're just gonna go around. So they are gonna draw one card from here and we're gonna see what it says. So this one says fold space. So basically what's gonna happen is that Earl Mimnon Thorvald is going to deploy an agent to the fold space spot on the board. So if I'd been hoping to go there, I no longer can because that space is blocked. However, um, the AI doesn't get the rewards that are printed by the space. Like they don't use cards or anything like that. So instead, what's going to happen is that they're just going to move up the influence track. So Earl Mimnon Thorvald now has a, an in with the Spacing Guild. There are ways for the AI to gain resources, especially through things like combat. One thing to watch out for is that they get certain amounts of resources. They can trade those in for victory points, and you don't want that to happen. So watch how many entry cards, how many waters, how many different things they get, but they're typically not going to get a ton of it off the cards. So that was the entire AI turn one. And now we're going to move over to Viscount Hundra Mortani, who's also going to go. Okay, so Hundra Mortani wanted to go to Carthag. However, I'm already there, so we're just going to discard this and draw another one. Ah, this one is Harvest Spice. We are also going to skip this one for now. So basically these spice places get bonus spice for every turn that somebody doesn't go there. Like they just get more and more valuable. So this one says, send an agent to the space with the most bonus spice or total spice of tide. If no spaces have bonus spice, then reveal another card. So if no spaces have bonus spice, we're gonna reveal another card. Ooh, this one is Conspire. That's kind of scary actually. <laughs> So basically, they don't have to pay the cost of anything, so they can just go to whatever space they want to go to. So Hundra Moritani is going to come to this conspire space that I can't afford right now. Jerk. Going to go up one on the influence track with the Emperor. So they've got their little alliance going. And they're going to get two troops. These two troops are going to go in their garrison and not in the middle of combat. And the reason for that, we'll just say this as their garrison, um, is that this is not a combat space with the cross swords. If the swords are crossed, the AI will put their troops into battle. If they are not there, that's not a combat space, you can't deploy troops that way, then they're going to put it in their garrison. And we're just going to ignore these swords at the bottom for now. I will show you what they do. So that was the AI turn. Now we're back to my turn and I get to do something else. So what do I want to do with my second agent, my precious, precious second agent? Again, convincing argument doesn't really have anything on it. So this is, we're just, this is dead weight until the reveal turn, which I will show you how to do. But let's see, I could basically use a yellow or I can use my signet ring to go somewhere else. Hmm. I think what I'm going to do is I'm going to go ahead and use my do the desert planet card to send one of my agents up here to smuggling where I'm going to get one money. So that's pretty good for me. And then I'm going to push my little tracker up here up one. So now the next time I get the symbol, I can choose to go back down and get either five money or two spice. But if I take the five money, they each get one as well. So be careful how much you use that, especially when they can just trade money for victory points. But I'm also going to kind of move up here maybe and get some of these better rewards. So we'll kind of see how that plays out. So once again, that was my turn. And I am done. Now we're going to go to Mimnon Thorvald again. He can deploy his second agent. Okay, so this one, uh, he basically is trying to do the same thing again. This isn't going to work out. If he has zero to one influence with the Spacing Guild, he'll go to Fold Space. But he already went there. He can't go twice. So this card is kind of moot. If he had more influence, then he'd be coming up here to get those same symbols that I was going for. So nothing for him on that card. We'll draw again. Harvest Spice, nothing. Dreadnought. Oh man, that monster. I'm not pleased. 
<laughs> okay, so basically what's going to happen is that he is going to send his agent here to the Dreadnought space. And that's going to be rough for me because that's going to mean that he gets a Dreadnought in his garrison. And of course, he doesn't have to pay for it, unlike me. How rude. He also would buy a tech if he could, but he doesn't have any spice to buy it with. So at least there's that. So basically he just went to his dreadnought space, got his dreadnought. If he had spice, he would buy a bit of technology as well. So not this time, but in the future. Then by Count Hunter Moritani's gonna go. And he wants to go to still suits. So we're gonna go over here to still suits. This is a combat space, so I'll get to show you what happens. But basically he is gonna move up this influence track by one. He is yellow. And then because this has the cross swords on it, and that means that you can deploy up to two troops from your garrison, he's gonna put his troops out. So that is what he did on this turn. And now all of our agents are out, but the turn's not totally over, it's my turn again. So I'm gonna do what's called a reveal turn. And that means that I am now gonna reveal the rest of the cards in my hand, the ones I didn't use to deploy agents. I'm out of agents, I can't do that anymore. So now I have two, three, four influence to spend on these cards. So what can I buy? So for four, I might just want to get Gunthopter because this is great. It makes opponents lose troops and it's got a lot of swords on it, which we're going to get to at some point. Shifting allegiances is kind of cool, but because I can move myself up and down the spacing guild to bump other allegiances, so I can think about that. That's kind of interesting. The scout's okay. It lets you retreat some of your troops, which is neat if you're going to lose and you want to hold on to some people because all the troops that you commit to combat die. So, except for your dreadnought, but we'll get to that. And then we have a truthsayer, Bene Gesserit, kind of neat. Got some good symbols on it. Let you cycle your cards. I mean, there's something cool. That's very cool. And then we have Sardaukar Legion, uh, which will get you Imperial influences if you want them. And then also some troops. Ooh, these are all great. I can't afford this one, but if I could, I'd probably get it. Cause dang, it's nice. Um, I think I'll go with the gun thopter cause that's something that in real life I would totally buy. So these, the, these bottoms of these cards are going to be used to pay four for this gun thopter. So this is my discard pile. This is also going to go in my discard pile. It's a very nice card. And then I'll just replace it on the market. Um, there is a variant where you can roll a die to flush the market more. So I could just roll. And then if it's one through five, I would remove that card. And then if it's a six, nothing happens. Like nobody else bought a card. Um, but that's up to me and I'm just going to be lazy and leave it out of this playthrough. But just so you know, you can, you can easily get your card row moving better. I'm just only playing like two sample turns, so I'm not going to bother. So I did my reveal. They don't really have any cards to reveal. So that will just skip around. And then what you go into is the combat phase of the round. So we are in combat. We are fighting over these rewards. And if I had swords on the bottom of the cards that I had revealed, then I would be able to contribute them to the fight. So if this was a card that I hadn't played for an action and I decided to use it in the reveal turn, then it gives me more combat value, which we'll talk about. We'll discard this by the way. So now we're in combat. I'm in the combat, Viscount Hundo, Hundro Moritani is in the combat, but um, Mimnon Thorvald never got involved because he didn't go to any spaces that had conflict. So basically we're gonna calculate our, uh, our combats. If we had entry cards that would affect that, we could play them. Um, and I'll show you how that works off the house hug all day. But basically we know that Hundro Moritani is gonna win this conflict, but I'm gonna get a consolation prize of three money and I ain't crying about it. So Hundro Moritani has a total of one, two, three, four combat right now, where I have a total of two. That's because each of these cubes is worth two and then daggers on the bottom of your cards. So if I played one during the reveal turn are worth one, the dreadnought is worth three and it doesn't die. Uh, basically, if you lose the combat, it goes back to your garrison. If you win, it's out for a round covering one of these spaces to get you a little bit of extra money or spice potentially during the next round. So now if I had any entry cards to play, I could choose to play them and we would go around until we ran out. Um, and basically the way the House Hagal does that is they flip a card at their turn and he would get two more combat. But that's kind of pointless for him because he was already gonna win. <laughs> so the way that this works is he will actually get these bonuses. So he'll go up one and then he will get a spice. 
And so I got to watch how much spice this dude gets because he can start buying tech with it if he gets a lot. And so that was one full round. And then we're just going to kind of clean up. So everybody discards everything. We're going to get all of our agents back. So I'll get my two agents back. So will Memnon Thorvald. And so will Hundred Mortani. Um, these all die. So they go back to our supplies because they were in combat. If they are in combat, they die. Everything resets to zero. Nobody has any victory points yet. And we're going to look at our next conflict card. So that one's going to be... Ooh, this one's for a victory point, so you know I'm going to want that. This is going to be a highly aggressive turn for me, if at all possible, because I ain't playing about those victory points. Then I'm going to draw my next hand of five, so this is just the other half of my starting hand. I've got some daggers, which is good, given that I want to fight. And we're going to see what I can do with these cards. The other thing is that first player is going to rotate, so Mimnon Thorvald will actually go first, and I'll show you how that works. All right, so let's get in it to win it for another turn of Dune Imperium. I'm going to stop after this one because I feel like this gives you a sense of how the game is played. And then as, as more famous board game people than I say, I'll leave you to discover the rest for yourself. <laughs> so um, here's my hand for this turn, by the way. I've got these great cards. Seek Allies is going to get trashed right away, but I can basically go and do a bunch of stuff over here if I want to. Um, or I can do some green stuff, but I don't think I do. So that's what I've got going on. Let's see how it goes. Okay, so, however, it's Midmon Thorvald's turn first, so let's draw a House of Gaul card for him. So he's gonna do a tech negotiation. So basically what this means is that he is going to put a, an agent here, and then it's either gonna let him buy a tech for one less spice, or he can put down a troop to make a future uh, tech cheaper for himself. So he doesn't have any spice to buy with. So what he's going to do, he's going to put a troop here and it's going to give him a minus one discount when he does have the spice to buy something. So watch out for him. Then it's going to be Hundred Mortani's turn. He's going to still suits again, which sucks because I want to go to still suits. What a monster. Uh, but he's going to come over here. He's going to get a water. And that's all he's going to do this time because he doesn't have any troops to deploy. So if he had any, he would, but he doesn't. So he won't. Now it's my turn. So I also want to be using these nice little alliances. So I also know for sure that I want to win this contest. For real. I'm not playing here. So I think what I'm going to do is assert my dominance, so to speak. Let's go ahead and play Seek Allies. I'm going to trash it after I play it. I'm going to spend my water in order to put an agent here on hardy warriors. So I'm going to move my influence up. I'm going to get two warriors for my supply. And I can put them and up to two of my other warriors out into the middle. And I'm just going to go all in. Even though I could play a little more conservative, I want to make sure that I have the best possible shot of winning this conflict. Because I really, really want it. Because I want the victory point. And I'll get my water back. Ha. So that's what I chose to do. Um, now it is somebody else's turn. So let's see. What will Memnon Thorvald do? So he is going to... Oh, I should have done this at the end of last turn. This is why you got to pay attention to this stuff. Okay. So the other thing I should have done at the end of last turn, apologies, is I should have put a little bonus spice on each of these spaces. Nobody sent an agent to any of these. So at the end of a turn, if nobody did, then you put a bonus spice there. So he's going to send an agent to the space with the most bonus spice or total spice of tide. Every space has one bonus spice. So he's going to come here to get four spice. So he's got his four spice. So remember how he couldn't afford tech last, last time he played a card that put him up here? Well, he can afford some tech now. So I need to be careful because he's going to start buying this stuff. And some of it's really, really good. Then it's Viking Hunter Mortani's turn. So he is wants to go. He wants to go to Arakeen. So he would like to fight with me a little bit, but he's not going to catch me, fortunately. So he's going to take his agent and put it here, and he's going to get one troop. Maybe he will get me. Who knows? And this will go straight out into the middle because it's a conflict space, and he can do that. Um, and then his other reward is his signet ring power. So, according to his signet ring, he has couriers. He spends one spice to go on the track. So basically he's going to spend this spice to pop up here one more time. And then I'm pretty sure I have to check the rules again that the next time he'll go down to the bottom and like get rewards. So he is messing around with shipping and that was he what he did on his second turn with his second agent. 
Now it's my turn, I can go again. So I wanna play Diplomacy. I'm gonna play Diplomacy and I wanna put someone, this is always kind of an interesting conundrum because there's so many good things to do. And I also wanna be building these alliances because they are productive for me. So maybe I wanna put an agent, let's say here, because I'm wanting to maybe go up here and buy stuff. The quicker I can get my Swordmaster, the better off I am. And Duke Lido's special power is that I can spend one less at these spaces. So having some money and then getting myself on the High Counselor, getting myself a Swordmaster, all these things have a benefit for me. So maybe that's what I want to do. So I'll move up here and then I'm going to get to Solari. So I have a little bit more money. I like money. And then that's my turn. So this would be everybody's reveal turn, but they don't have a hand. They don't have a hand. I do. So I've got these two daggers that are going to play in a moment. And I just have two money. Um, maybe I'll pick up the scout just because it has good symbols and I can retreat some troops. Like that's useful. And then the frame in the camp came out. That's maybe nice later. And then I'm not going to do anything else with this card. Um, and then this is the rest of my reveal turn. I have these two for combat. So let's go ahead and calculate my combat aggression. I went all in on this and it turns out I didn't have to, but I'm not sorry. Um, <laughs> so I had eight for my guys and then nine, 10. Hun and then our good friend, Hunter Moritani was also in this conflict. And so he would have two. And then we're gonna flip a House of Gaul card. Ooh, he had four on there. So he was actually much closer to me than one might've thought. It's actually a good thing that I went all in because I'm gonna win this conflict. The combat is mine, and that's going to give me the first victory point of the game. Drew first blood, and I'm going to get a water. Hunter Moritani is going to get a water and a spice. So this is bad, though, because these three water, he's going to be able to trade in for a victory point. So the way that works is that every time they get three water, they spend it uh, to get a victory point. So he got one out of that combat as well, which sucks for me, but at least we're tied instead of me falling behind. So be careful how much you let them get because it's dangerous. So for cleanup, all of our dudes go back to supply. I'm going to need to rebuild my little army over here. All of our agents come back. Also, we had an agent here, so there won't be any bonus spice here, but we would put bonus spices on these two spaces. And while that didn't get into every single rule, uh, that is an overview of how you play Dune Imperium with the Rise of Ix expansion. I really like this game. I think it's super tight. It's super good. And then hopefully just a couple of sample turns gave you a sense of game flow so that you will be more ready to jump into it solo yourself. Thanks so much for watching. Please like, subscribe, maybe support me on Patreon. And most of all, happy gaming.